Okay. Here we go. Here we go. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another live that I am doing today. Um, this time around, I've linked this through Zoom, and I'm going to try to screen share so that I can show the video that I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'll just wait for a few people to join first. If you join this late, I would just recommend looking up the video because it is all over the internet at this point. So yeah, so basically for those of you who do not know who Mark Todd is, he's a pretty prominent figure in the horse world and very well known and very successful at upper levels as well. So he, when compared to other trainers, should be held to a higher degree of expectation when it comes to training um and it sounds like he's gotten like there, there's stuff being done now like i'm just looking up he's he's lost his training license for like a like just a temporary suspension um because he is going to be investigated by like the horse racing authorities in his area um so that part is good however i would say that like that's kind of like a slap on a wrist on the wrist. Like I think that more so than anything, it's speaking like for the fact that like obviously like people are gonna want to distance themselves as much as they can from people like him when they are under fire, regardless of whether or not their intention is actually to hold the person accountable long term. So like the suspension is kind of a preliminary thing that's like we're not actually doing anything to damage your career, but this is kind of for damage control for us. At least that's how I see it. So for those of you who aren't in the loop, I'm going to just share my screen and then we can kind of take a peek at what he has done because yeah um it's like I don't know like it's not what I would call uncommon to see in horse training unfortunately um so like unfortunately like it should be more uncommon than it is but unfortunately it is not so um so yeah with that in mind just keep that in mind that like a lot of trainers are probably guilty of the same stuff. And I, I'm going to kind of get into that at in, in a second. So we're just going to play the video. Um, this is the full video as sent to me by the person who did it. Her horse has a fear of the water. So that's kind of for reference. And as you can see, he already has got the branch in his hand, so. The horse took a couple of odd steps through the water that would make me wonder if there's some big stones in there that you can't see that he's stepping on. Oh, the laughing in the background. Haha, <laughs> so funny. One thing I want people to note is that he's already hit the horse with the branch once at this point, and it's not addressing the problem because the horse was scared to go in and it gets worse. Like the video that's actually gone viral from this is like the worst part of it um, where he's hitting repeatedly. So I just want to wait for that part of this video. Yeah, right here. Okay. So that's the video in question. And like one thing that I think people need to note from like a training perspective is the horse went through the water better the first couple times before he actually hit it that hard. So what this means is that if he's using the branch to pressure the horse to go into the water this whole time, he has kind of failed at his job as a trainer because he's literally just made the situation worse than what it needed to be because the horse gets more scared and stops and one thing before we get into talking about this from like mark todd's side that i want to address is that i've seen a lot of com like i've seen a lot of comments regarding this video where people are like oh why didn't the rider say something like the rider needs to advocate for her horse like shame on the rider she's just as bad as mark todd and like i want to address that because i think it completely 
completely fails to acknowledge like the difference in like power dynamics because one mark todd is a man two he is very very prominent figure in the horse world super well respected this person would have gone into this clinic thinking that they're going to get a clinic with one of the masters of the sport so already you'd be nervous and you'd be wanting to impress this person because they've been idolized and they've been sold to you as a professional who knows what they're doing. So one, the rider probably never even thought in her mind before entering the clinic that this was a possibility for something he would do. Two, in those situations, when you're not expecting them, it's way easier when you're watching them in third person at the end. Like even if you are the person in the video, when you rewatch it, it's easier to look at it and start picking apart all the things you could have done differently. But when you're in that situation, it is a very, very normal response for someone to kind of just freeze up and be kind of in shock and not know how to handle it I couldn't hear exactly what the writer was saying but it does sound like she tried to cut him off and be like hey like could we try something like she doesn't sound comfortable with it and he just keeps going he just keeps going it, it's not it's not helpful to try to criticize her as someone who is on a horse that is panicking and trying to manage handling the horse without hurting herself or the horse when there is a man who is coming at her as like the adversary with a whip and repeatedly striking like without any hesitation he just keeps going and going and going so even if she was standing there trying to advocate for herself he's not listening and he probably can't be heard that well over the slapping of the branch and like that aside like yes riders can advocate for their horses more and I'm sure after this instance the girl in the video would be advocating for her horse a lot more but in these situations where you feel trapped and you're not sure how to react it is very easy to shut down and just like like honestly for me like I've been in similar situations before where it's not quite to this degree but where trainers have tried to pressure my horses in clinics in similar ways in the past. And there have been instances where I have sat there and let it happen because there's the hope like, oh, maybe they're only going to do it once or twice and then stop. And then after they stop, you could say something and be like, I think that this would work better. And I bet she didn't think he was going to go that hard slapping the horse that many times. But that aside, like, Instead of putting the onus on a rider who is like a junior or amateur rider who is seeking out professional opinion from someone who is well known in the community and supposed to be a professional expert at this job, instead of putting the blame on her, put the blame on him. This man is like in his 60s or 70s, I think. He's been around the block for a long time. He's competed in eventing. He's, com he's really well known in the racing community too and has done a lot of stuff in the racing community. He's very prominent in the horse world. So instead of putting the onus on people who are going to him for his expertise to try to hold him accountable when he is like so far above where they are in terms of the level of respect he would receive from the everyone in the horse world and the level of expertise he's claiming to have, instead of putting the onus on the people who are in the clinic, it should all fall onto him because at the end of the day, we have a grown ass man in his 60s or 70s who has a ton of horse experience and should be able to train better. That is making a younger rider uncomfortable and feel trapped and continually hitting their horse for a video in a clinic in front of crowds of people. So what first of all, what this tells me is I don't actually believe that he is all that sorry because like if it really was just like a lapse in patience, first of all, it wouldn't happen repeatedly every time the horse like pauses to go into the water. Um, and secondly, it's typically not something that you do in front of a large crowd of people if you're actually just losing your patience. Um, like, I think that he did, like, he's only apologizing now, I think, because it's something that he's been caught doing, because in order to be comfortable doing something like that in front of a large clinic audience, especially while you're being filmed, you have to be pretty comfortable doing the thing. Like, it has to be something that you're not worried about being received badly, especially when you're allowing filming to occur during the clinic. So, Anyone who's even for a second considering blaming the rider and saying that she should have done better by her horse, put all that blame on Mark Todd because he is the one that is masquerading as a professional and like selling his advice for a lot of money and putting, I don't know how old she was in the clip when it was filmed, but I'm assuming she's a junior rider. Um, putting a junior rider in that position where they are basically trapped between a rock and a hard place and have one of their idols like power tripping and doing stuff like that, it's not a 
comfortable or safe place to be in. And even just from like the rider safety in terms of like talking about the reaction of the horse, Mark Todd endangered that rider more than he needed to. And in a way that's not even helpful for solving the behavior that he's trying to solve. So he put her in a position where her horse could have reacted more dangerously due to how scared he was and due to feeling trapped between the branch and the water. And she didn't get any real say over it because he never paused or gave her a chance to do it. And he just kept going. And she does sound like she tries to cut him off when he's really going at the horse of the branch. But that aside, it's like he is the professional in the situation. So like he needs to be held to a higher degree of accountability. We can't put all of the blame on riders with their horses who are seeking out professional advice to hold all professionals accountable for their shit behavior. That is not fair. The professionals need to hold themselves accountable. And so that aside, like from a training perspective for the horse, the horse learned nothing other than the fact that the water is scary because to put it in perspective for teaching, if you have an animal or a person who is afraid of something and you are making them advance towards the thing that they are afraid of forcibly, and the only thing that is really encouraging them to go in is sheer discomfort on the other side. It's like basically having a kid like who is afraid of let's say swimming and you just fucking tase them until they go into the water like they're not learning anything they're not going to learn that the water is not scary they're just going to learn that they do not have an option and that they have to just deal with these things and be uncomfortable and have to work despite that discomfort and despite that fear they're never actually being taught how to address the fear if your tactic for helping them through something is just by trying to be scarier than the thing that they're afraid of. All they're learning is like, holy shit, if I don't go in, I'm going to get beaten. But when I do go in, I'm still scary because I've not been taught how to handle this fear. So from a training perspective, what he's doing is entirely ineffective. And I would wager that this horse would have left this clinic with either the exact same problem with water as he had before or worse. And so like, this is why it's even worse because someone with Mark Todd standing in the community, I can't imagine he's charging cheap prices for his clinic. It probably wasn't a cheap clinic at all. He's probably making a killing off of teaching these clinics, but then he's also using tactics that are giving people's horses behavioral problems that they could take with them for years after that. And that's the real problem there is that he's a professional who is selling his advice at high rates and using stuff that like, literally makes no sense from a behavioral standpoint like there is no benefit to training how he trains in this clip in terms of how the horse experiences it and what they learn from it and one thing that I think we need to be really careful of when we're addressing these types of things is not being so sympathetic of the abuser that we just write off all their actions like the other thing I wanted to address is I've seen going around now someone made a meme that's like I support Mark Todd that's all it says. The meme just says, I support Mark Todd. I saw Lainey Ashker share it. I already did not really like her. She gave me the ick from doing a couple of other things over the last few years. Not my type of person, not my cup of tea, but now I really, really dislike her because even if you're going to say like, okay, this was a lapse in his horsemanship. He made a mistake. That's not an indicator of who he is as a horse person. Okay, fine. But By just saying I support Mark Todd and sharing a vague meme like that, you are saying you support his actions in this controversy. So if you're going to say you support Mark Todd in any capacity, you need to follow up with, I think Mark Todd is a decent horse person, but I do not support his actions in this video. Otherwise, by saying I support Mark Todd, you're saying I support whipping horses with branches to get them to do things that they are afraid of. And that's where I don't think that this is okay. Why are we? allowing a fucking grown man who is like in his 70s i'm going to look up his age who who to have a fucking temper tantrum why are we enabling a grown man to behave in such a way that is not okay like we shouldn't be condoning this behavior he's a grown ass man he doesn't need to take out his temper on a horse like that and if by chance you do have a lapse in your ability to control your emotions then it shouldn't be something where you are like not admitting to it, you know, like you can have a lapse in control and you can do something where you lose your temper with a horse and like hit them with something. And honestly, like a lot of people who've grown up in traditional riding backgrounds at some point have probably hit their horse with a whip, maybe not to the degree in the video, but you've probably smacked them with a whip to try to get them to do something they're afraid of. Most of us have, but 
how you respond to that is what says everything. So everyone who is saying, I support Mark Todd and just doing that vaguely and like supporting him in the sense that they're supporting his actions in this video, what they're saying is I support horse abuse. So everyone who's doing that, I don't support because I can get it if you respect him enough as a horse person that you don't think that this is an indicator of his horsemanship and you want to continue liking him for the good that he does display, like whatever you can do that. I don't necessarily agree with that, but like you don't have to support his actions in this video to say that you think he's a decent horse person in other ways. And so basically all that this is exposed is that like someone like Lainey Ashker, who's sharing that post, she probably does the same shit to her horses. There's no reason why you would be so supportive of this instance of behavior unless you're condoning the actions in yourself and people around you. And like, like, I don't know, like, like, fuck, I, I've, I've used whips or brooms or rakes and stuff to get horses into trailers. I don't beat them with it by winding up like I'm fucking like swinging a baseball bat like Mark Todd did but I did do that in the past and like I could look back on stuff like that and go that was wrong to do now I know a better way I won't do that again I lost my patience on a horse I took out my lack of experience on the horse I took out my lack of ability to help the, the horse's fear on the horse all of those things are my fault I can look back at that and go that was wrong to do I shouldn't do it again and that's how someone like Mark Todd or anyone who supports him should look back on this instance of behavior is go that was a lapse in his emotional control he took out his emotions on the horse he took out his frustration on the horse and he did what was easy for him to do physically to get into like a lazy aspect of training that doesn't actually teach the horse anything and other than that like there's no reason to excuse his behavior unless you're actually excusing the abuse of the horse like even for someone like him it's like it's okay to look back and go like I did something wrong but then why are we making memes about supporting Mark Todd when it's very clearly about like, I just don't want Mark Todd to receive any accountability for his behavior to like, like, I don't know, like, like it, it's not, I, I do get it can seem like a witch hunt because so many people are outraged by this, but also like he knew he was being filmed. He knew he was in front of a clinic full of people who could be judging him and be uncomfortable with that. And he chose to do it anyways. And even more so like, the fact that it's becoming something where people are taking sides and being like, oh, like, let's support this guy for what he did. It's like so weird. It's exposing how many people are actually OK with this behavior. And it's not really justifiable because it's not good training. Like it's shitty, lazy training where trainers are just taking out their own frustration, ignorance and lack of training ability on the horse. Like that's exactly what it is. And I say that as someone who used to use these more forceful tactics to get horses to do something. Like if I had a horse refuse several years ago, like before I got Milo, 100%, like my trainers would have told me to whip the horse and I would have done it without question. And it's up to the person doing it to actually hold themselves accountable for their behavior and self-reflect. Like, even if you're actively trying to better your training and you are trying to use softer methods, if you have a really bad day where all of your triggers are stacked and your horse does something where you snap and revert to your old training tactics and smack your horse or something, it is up to you to look at that and go, I've had a really bad day. My trigger is stacked and I responded to this situation incorrectly. I could have handled it better. And it's up to you as a person to do that. And people who choose not to do that are more concerned about not getting in trouble than they actually are about doing what's right. So I find like, honestly, even like more disconcerting than like Mark Todd's actual actions is watching people respond to it and out themselves as people who would do literally the exact same thing to handle this behavior in a horse when there's easier ways of doing it. Like, there's so many different routes he could have taken to help this horse with his issue with the water. Like, first of all, when the horse is trotting up to the water, like don't trot him. If he's afraid, walk him up, let him look over the edge, walk him around the water, let him look around. Like if, if he's really scared, put him on a long line, let a rider get off, put on some fucking muck boots and walk him through the water. Give him a treat every time he steps towards the water. Like there's so many different ways they could have handled this that actually would have addressed the root cause, which is a fear of jumping into the water. And the, it would have worked better. It probably would have been less time consuming. It would have been less frustrating for him and the rider. And it would have been a hell of a lot less scary for the horse. There's a number of different ways that he could have handled this that would have achieved the same result and would have actually helped the horse to 
get over his problem, but he chose to take the easy way out where you just get to feel powerful and like you're doing something, but really all it is is taking out frustration on the horse. And like the other thing that I think we need to change with how people view clinics is if you go to a clinic and you're bringing a horse who has like a refusing problem or a problem with water, et cetera, like the goal of the clinic for, especially if it's only like a one day or two day clinic can't be to have the horse fully fixed on that problem. It should just be to get some level of improvement. Like the goal isn't to just completely fix a problem that the horse has probably been struggling with for a little while. Like it should just be for improvement. Like clinics can't be all about showboating and trying to do these quick fixes. Otherwise it kind of defeats the purpose which is learning tools to help your horse's continued progress in the best way possible rather than doing things that might be a quick fix on that specific day but don't actually address the problem long term and I think that a lot of clinicians feel pressure to try to do things fast and to try to take these shortcuts to try to look like they're doing more and teaching more but like good teaching isn't always fast the easy and fast way isn't always going to be the best and it's not always going to take you places where you're going to like have lasting success and like it's just it's troubling to see like I, I looked up his age he's 65 so it's a 65 year old man who's been in the industry for this long that still viewed that as an acceptable response and like I've been in the industry a lot less time than he has. And I've gone through like a lot of personal growth in my riding. And like, I would hope to God that by 65, I would have eradicated those habits from my repertoire as a trainer so that they wouldn't come about ever, let alone in front of an entire clinic of people where it can be filmed. And like, it's a choice. And this isn't me to say that this isn't me saying like, oh, let's just all cancel Mark Todd forevermore. Like he's never capable of change. No, like he might, maybe he will learn something from this, but because of the industry response being like, oh, get off Mark Todd's back. I support Mark Todd. Let's not criticize Mark Todd. Let's not hold Mark Todd accountable. I think it's less likely that he will actually learn something because people are more worried about sweeping this issue under the rug and not holding him accountable because they feel attacked by what other people are saying since they're guilty of the same things so they have motivation to be like let's just ignore this as a problem and do something else and that's the biggest issue I think is that people are motivated to just ignore this type of thing and pretend it's no big deal even though like these little like little like not that I'd call this a little abuse but like little in the sense that he didn't draw blood or anything Like these little abuses enable the larger forms of abuse that people are more likely to completely disagree with. But like all these little things being normalized, especially when you have prominent figures in the horse world that are like, I support Mark Todd. What he did is fine. It's totally cool to beat your horse to the branch. You're setting a bad precedent for everyone in the horse world. And it also makes us look like complete and utter pieces of shit to literally everyone else worldwide. Like, I can tell you right now that no one outside the horse world is watching that video going like, oh, yeah, like, this is fine. Like, what a great method of training. I like this. No, they're looking at it and going, wow, horse people are fucking assholes to their animals. I hate horse people. Wow, this guy's a prominent figure in the horse world. That must mean a lot of people support him, which must mean a lot of horse people support handling their animals like this. And then you guys wonder why people are anti horseback riding and why people think horseback riding is set such an uh, like a sport that exploits animals so much. It's because we're fucking highlighting the worst of it and literally defending people and acting like being held accountable for a lapse in judgment is wrong and mean and bullying or witch hunty. And no, like it's called accountability. He did something extremely publicly to someone else's horse. Like that's another thing to reiterate. This wasn't even his own horse. He took the liberty of doing this to a horse that was not his and endangering both horse and rider in the process. And he's being held accountable for it as he fucking should be. Like, why are we condoning this behavior in grown ass men? And like, why are we showcasing how much we don't care about our animals on such a worldwide basis? Like, think about even in just the last calendar year since the Olympics, how many scandals there have been about equine welfare. Do you you really think that bodes well for us as a community? There has been 
so many abuse scandals that have been so publicized that the average non-horsey person does end up seeing them. And this is all they are seeing of our sport. It is up to us to actually start caring about holding people accountable. Otherwise, our sport is going to go under because of our desire to protect these assholes and defend their every action. There's no reason to keep doing that. Like we're going to lose the sport. We're looking so bad right now. There's been so many abuse scandals and there's very little in comparison that actually gets displayed of good horsemanship because bad horsemanship is so rampant. And so many of the people at the top of the sport have had these scandals that you can find online quite easily where there is literally like videos of their abusive animals and like on a consistent basis, you can see it in their programs and like I just don't, I don't really think that people realize the gravity of the situation because like there's so many blatant welfare problems in the horse world that are written off as not an issue, despite literally being scientifically proven as being welfare deficits. And it makes us look like morons to the average person when you have all of this proof and also stuff that should just be common sense and usually is common sense. And the only reason it's not common sense for horse people is because we're quite literally brainwashed into thinking a certain way and into normalizing these types of abuses so that we don't consider it abuse once you've been indoctrinated into that for so many years. But then like the average person that is just watching this happen and is like, that's pretty fucking weird that how horse people train their horses is just by hitting them until they do something that they want them to do. Like the average person looks at it more through the lens of like, Hey, like shouldn't training be about like rewarding the animal for what you want? Um, I don't know. And I think that like more so than like Mark Todd's response, the response of other equestrians is what makes me nervous because I've seen so many people defend his behavior and be like, oh, well, like people are lying if they've said they've not had success treating these behavioral problems doing this way. And it's like, um, pardon, like way to just out the fact that like no one knows how to handle fear behaviors in horses without hitting them. And Yeah, like I would say like Mark Todd's apology in terms of as far as apologies go, it was better than like the vast majority. So I would agree with that because like he like, I don't know, like people like Andy Kocher, when they were called out, like they were literally just doing damage control and doing everything they could to deny the fact that they did everything wrong and literally just lie about it. I'm glad that Mark Todd accepted some level of accountability and said that he wasn't impressed by his behavior, but also like until you see the change in behavior, I personally don't have any reason to believe that he wouldn't do that again until you actually see a change in behavior. So if he teaches a clinic again where he has a similar problem and then handles it in a more positive and rewarding way, then that would earn my trust back. But until you actually see the change in behavior, for me, I wouldn't ever do a clinic with someone like that and I think that I think that we're at a huge turning point in the horse world where we can turn and we could start welcoming more rewards-based science-based methods and really reforming the horse world and making it more ethical or people who are abusive and who are promoting the wrong in the horse world they're gonna get louder and we're gonna just get more and more of these abuse scandals because cameras and social media and stuff is like so much more prevalent now and it's gonna result in horse sports being completely destroyed because of the abuses being so publicly presented that people are gonna want to advocate against horse sports for the welfare of the horses and honestly can you blame them if this is all they see They don't see the good in it. And until we actually start to make mass changes in the horse world that allow the good people in the horse world to be represented in competition, to show that competition can be done ethically until we do that, we're not going to like see much of a difference in the societal outlook on horse people. Like honestly, I bet over the last year, how people view equestrian sports has just gone downhill. It's very hard to view it as ethical if it's always what you see in the media being not ethical. If you have no other experience with the horse world and have no other experience seeing people be nice to horses or seeing them actually treat them like partners rather than machines, you're not going to believe that it's possible. And this is the case for a lot of people who have like who have watched horse sports or who have seen it in the media. A lot of them don't support it or like it. And I don't really blame them because 
when you're constantly getting this stuff thrown in your face, it's very disheartening. And that's also like with these people not even having like a knowledge of how to properly read equine behavior. So they're only noticing the more overt cases of it. And then like, I don't know, like I've talked about TikTok a lot. There's a lot of normalized abuse on TikTok. And that's also being fed to people who are not liking horse people. Like we're not doing anything to help our case, honestly. And um, there's like a handful of like upper level equestrians that actually uphold good practice and aren't like this. And like, that's great, but they're generally not the ones who garner the most respect and attention. And there's not enough of them to make up for the huge surplus of shitty equestrians that we have. So it's, it's concerning to me because like, I I just see this going in a very poor direction and I don't think people are actually being honest with themselves with the impact that this could have on a worldwide scale for the horse world. And I think that we need to start being more selective over the professionals that we blindly support. Like, for example, like you can appreciate the fact that someone is a good rider and you can appreciate their competition experience. You can think that they have a lot of talent as a rider. But that doesn't mean that like welfare is the forefront of their concerns for their horse. And I don't know, like, like I mentioned before, the fact that Lainey Ashker is sharing like I support like Mark Todd without any further explanation to say like, yeah, I support him as a horseman because he's done a lot for the sport, but I don't support his actions in this video. I do not support any upper level equestrian like that like honestly that makes me actually dislike her more than him in some ways because he has at least in some way held himself accountable for his behavior by apologizing and addressing it but she's completely shrugging off what he did and just going like I support him let's not hold people accountable for this and like that type of attitude like that type of like apathy towards abuse and even like the encouragement of it more so is what promotes it the most in the horse world like if people weren't so like oh like whatever like he just hit a horse with a branch like whatever like stop bullying him if people were like nah like that's not okay mark like do something else and if we just like actually like like held people accountable but still leave space for them to change and grow as horse people then it would be less comfortable for people to just openly do these types of things and there'd be a higher likelihood of people calling it out when they see it occurring instead of laughing like we saw in the video. So I think we need to normalize, first of all, the idea that people can change and grow, but also that accountability isn't a bad thing. Like if you do something bad, own up to it. Like we, we even like with purely positive trainers, you can have bad training sessions where you might frustrate a horse by accident. <clears throat> And you can look back at them and you can go, hey, I could have handled that better. And now that I've looked back on that and gained that perspective, I can train better now the next time I have the horse out. And especially when you lose your patience to the point where you physically take it out on the horse. If you can't look back on that and go, I lost my patience, there's a better way of dealing with this. Then you seriously are in desperate need of some self-reflection because that is like horrendous. Like that's horrendously bad to be that ignorant to your own mistakes that you can't like sit back and go, I lost control of my emotions. Like it's not really any different. Has anyone else had a bad day where you've like had a shitty day at work or school, you get home, you fucking stub your toe and you're just cranky. And then like someone you typically get along really well with like a parent, friend, family member, so on. They come in and maybe they do something that's mildly irritating and you snap at them and you go off on them and you snap at them and you're pissed off and you take it out on the person, even though you're angry at your entire day. All of us have probably done that at some point. And if you can't look back at that and go, I took out my anger on my friend, my family member, or so on, because of my bad day, it was actually problems I was experiencing internally that I chose to project onto someone else and take out on them. And that's my fault. If you can't start to do that, then you're not ever going to be able to self-reflect and grow because you're basically never holding yourself accountable. You're just blaming all of your frustrations and all of like your internal motivations and emotions on like the environment around you and not actually like holding yourself accountable for how you choose to react to it. And like starting to hold yourself accountable for that is very key to becoming like a better person and actually growing from your mistakes. And 
it's just it's not that hard sorry I have allergies my nose is so itchy um it's not that hard to do and it like literally costs nothing so and like I said this in my live from yesterday like it's very freeing to start admitting to your mistakes and to start going like okay like here's where I could have done something better I did this because of this because it's giving a name to all of the emotions that you're feeling and it's like labeling why you're behaving a certain way and then that allows you to more easily correct it so I think it's really concerning the lack of accountability that we like allow in the horse world and actually like actively encourage because like Anytime I see like these types of abuse articles, there's the side of people who do talks like I do where they're like talking about welfare and they talk about why it bothers them and that's all great. But then you have the whole side who their entire motivation is just trying to sweep the issue under the rug and be like, oh, well, not everyone does it or, oh, it's not that bad. Mark Todd doesn't usually do that. He's usually great. Like that's just one instance. You're nitpicking. You're this is a witch hunt. And it's all about like just trying to draw the heat off of the situation without actually accepting any accountability. And those types of people are pretty clearly exposing like the way that they like to train and not wanting to change for the better. And they're going to ruin it for all of us. So like, this is my encouragement to people who might train better than those people and who could look at that video and go, yeah, I wouldn't do that. But like, everyone's entitled to train how they want to, or like, it wasn't that bad. Horses have thick skin or whatever the fuck excuse you want to make. If you're compelled to either make excuses or just be apathetic towards these situations, I really want you to consider how much you like having horses around and riding them or competing them. Like whether you ride for pleasure or compete or both, I want you to consider how much you actually like doing that because by not holding people like this accountable when they do wrong things, you're basically saying that you're, you're okay with them totally fucking up how people view the horse world and in turn how people will label and generalize you as a horse person. So it's just, we, it, it, we can't keep being this apathetic if we actually want to have our sport exist and be respected. So we need change. Oh my God, I hate having allergies. My nose is so itchy. But it's up to us. The power is in our hands. And there's a lot more of us who are not Mark Todd's that could say like, hey, we don't like this, Mark. Can you not do that? And accountability actually incites change. So like, what is there to lose? That's my question. What is there to lose? in holding someone accountable. It doesn't mean you have to completely cancel him and write him off as a horse person. It just means you can look at the situation and go, yeah, that was not it. I don't support that. And I want to see change from this guy. And um, yeah, so there's like a lot of good horse people out there and you don't have to support every single thing someone does and says to like appreciate aspects of their training, but also like when they do something that you very clearly don't support or that is wrong, I think it's important to like talk about that and not just blindly be in support of someone and just ignore their faults when they are like quite damaging to a voiceless creature that is the horse. Like the horse can't advocate for itself. They are utterly reliant on us to advocate for them. Completely reliant. And the thing that I find really concerning is the way the horse world functions. We hold horses more accountable than we hold the people training them. So if a horse doesn't want to go in the water because they're scared or if they rear up or buck or bolt or do something bad because of the training environment that they're in, People will use that as a reason to justify the abuse of them and be like, oh, well, they did this, so I need to hit them and do this, or we need to get after them and put them in their place. That behavior is unacceptable, blah, blah, blah. They'll do that freely. But then when you criticize the person who is mishandling the horse, they'll be like, oh, well, like they deserve a chance. Like this is a witch hunt. You, you weren't there. You didn't see the whole situation. So you can't judge. And it's like, OK, but then like, how is it even remotely logical to go the horse like the horse needs to be shown who's boss? If we can't judge the whole situation because we are not there, how is it that someone like Mark Todd is allowed to judge the situation and decide that violence is the answer when the horse is confused and doesn't even speak the same language as anyone else and literally doesn't know the purpose of the task that it's being asked to do? 
how is it fair to hold the horse accountable and make it the horse's responsibility to take abuse from someone like Mark Todd if Mark Todd can't be held accountable for how he responds and how he treats a voiceless animal that literally is entirely reliant on his teachings to learn its job in the first place? Like, the disconnect is incredible. We hold, we literally hold our horses more accountable than we ha- hold trainers accountable. And our horses are like, it, it's ironic because so many horse people will be like, oh, it's never the horse's fault. But then like their every action says otherwise. And I just like, don't, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And I don't know, like I see, I see we're going to be our own demise as horse people if we don't get it together, the full stop. That's like basically the gist of this live is like, we're going to undo the entire horse world and cause problems and lose our privileges to do what we do and what we've taken for granted because of how we behave and how we enable the behavior of other people. And it's like, what is it going to take before horse people start going like, yeah, we should probably be kinder and nicer to our horses. And like, maybe just maybe we should hold trainers more accountable than we hold our horses. Like, I don't know. I think that the whole thing is like, just freaking embarrassing like it's a freaking embarrassment and I'm quite ashamed to be part of an industry where people think that it's not acceptable to hold like a 65 year old man accountable for like beating a horse on video but they think that the horse should have to take that beating because it didn't want to go into the water and they wanted it to so yeah in training I would recommend that is like consider like when you get upset with your horse or you're mad that they're not doing something for you consider how much more accountable you're holding them for their behavior than you're holding yourself because like your horse's re- reaction and response to training is like a reflection of the training itself so if you don't like the response you're receiving the first place you got to look is from within and it horses can be frustrating to work with even when you're using rewards based methods training isn't easy it can be frustrating you can hit walls horses respond to different things differently but it's not an excuse to beat them and if we want people to take us seriously as a sport and actually have respect for us as athletes then we need to stop taking out our frustration on animals and having such bad sportsmanship like it's the it, it is the way worse equivalent of watching some jackass like hockey player fucking breaking their hockey stick on the ice and throwing a temper tantrum when they lose a game. But it's way worse because instead of taking their anger out on a piece of inanimate equipment, they're taking it out on a living and breathing creature instead. And yeah. Training is do- training doesn't need to be like that. And it's actually more successful if you lower the amount of fear and stress. And that is a fact. Like it's a scientific fact, an undeniable fact. And the only thing is stopping people from realizing that is their own frustration with themselves and their own training programs that they then project onto their horses and use as a reason to mistreat their horses. So yeah. A professional once said, I can't say some didn't require pretty firm discipline that looks scary to someone who didn't know better yeah and see like that talk right there too where people say like it looks scary to people who don't know better it's like the separation of like us versus them where it's like oh like the people who advocate for welfare are just less educated and don't know better which is ironic because like if you even do a cursory search on punishment in any animal species the follow-up behaviors and risk factors of it are pretty much unanimously the same and it's like one of the more studied topics of behavior so it's not something that people can deny so I hate trainers that use that justification because it's like you're saying that people just don't know better they don't know what they're looking at when the people who are looking are actually looking at it through a more educated lens and using behavioral science to criticize the training and yet they'll be like oh well they just don't know better but then they never actually substantiate why it is the people who criticize harsh training methods don't know better. Like, it's like, what is it that we don't know? We don't know how to be lazy. We don't know how to be ignorant. We don't know how to take the easy way out. We don't know how to deny science. We don't know how to just not care about our horses. What is it? I don't know. And it shouldn't be that hard. 
it shouldn't be that controversial to just be like, hey, like if we're going to use animals for sport, we need to actually consider how they feel in training and like value their emotions. Like it doesn't fucking matter what I think of training. If I'm happy in training, that's good for me. But like we're working with an animal and like how they feel about training is more important. Like how they experience what you're teaching them is what is most important because they are the learner. What you think as the teacher is irrelevant because you are teaching them. You have to teach the learner in the way that they can best learn. And if you're not willing to do that, then you don't need to be training. And a lot of people aren't qualified to train. And I find it like it's a huge cop out to have all these upper level equestrians whose only real credentials are just like, oh, yeah, like I rode a five star event horse at a show and I have no behavioral education. But believe what I say, punishment is fine and has no follow up behaviors because I said so. People will believe those guys because of their like their show records and they then like these upper level equestrians waltz around and they're like oh we're so much better than everyone people are just uneducated they don't know better to criticize me you've never competed at my level so you can't criticize me and they literally weaponize their privilege and their elitism and their status that is largely because of their ability to fund it and fund showing and being who they are in the first place they use that as a means to discredit everyone else despite the fact that a lot of those people are more educated than them like I refuse to believe that we should listen to someone just because they can jump high jumps at big shows and win money even if it's at the detriment of their horse I refuse to believe someone like that over someone who has studied science for a living and like their entire career is dedicated to the pursuit of information without bias I would respect them way more, even if they can't jump a fucking six foot dish or whatever that five star eventers do. And here's the other thing. When you get comfortable being frustrated with your horse and taking your anger out on your horse, it becomes like that, like the reaction where you just do it right away. Like I grew up being taught by my trainers as a kid to take out my frustration on a horse. I already have ADHD, which means that emotional control is something that I already struggle with and it can be difficult. So trainers giving me such an easy means to take out my frustration on horses and punish them for things and feel righteous in doing so was a very dangerous method of teaching me like self-control and how to manage bad behavior and horses. It was very dangerous because it's highly reinforcing to me as the punisher when I was like a kid and I'm frustrated with my horse because I can't get him to do what I wanted him to do, despite the fact that it's probably me who is confusing him and doing things wrong. But my trainer taught me that it was acceptable when your horse gets heavy in the mouth to freaking seesaw on their mouth or reef on their mouth, or if they bite you to just swack them, or if they refuse to jump to whack them with a whip. So then when I got frustrated and I hit a wall in training that was my go-to response is to just blame and get frustrated at the horse and essentially throw a fucking temper tantrum that's what a lot of these trainers are teaching their students that it's like hey yeah like if your horse doesn't do what you want it's totally chill if you just fucking throw a tantrum and take it out on them and it's so easy to get into that mindset because it's reinforcing to punish an animal when you're already frustrated because you get to take out your anger on an animal and it's easy to do that The effort it takes to break free of that mindset and actually care enough to learn more and try to learn better ways. It's it's a difficult effort and it involves like a lot of personal reflection and self growth and honestly like going to like therapy basically and like learning tactics of emotional control that are better like it takes a lot of self growth and the desire to want to be better and it's not an easy journey because it means that you're admitting that what you did was wrong and you're admitting that there are better ways of training and you're admitting that your responses in the past weren't the best, which can be hard for some people to do, but you'll be so much happier as a result. Cause instead of being like stuck in this, like really frustrated, angry mindset where it's like you versus the horse and you're like adversaries. And when the horse doesn't do what you want, you're mad at them and frustrated and like view yourself as a failure, as a rider and a trainer, if you can't make the horse do something instead of being like that, it goes back to being like calm and being you and the horse versus the problem. And like, holding yourself more accountable where if the horse starts to do something that you don't want them to see, you start looking at it and going like, what are they struggling with? How can I help them with this more? And then you calm down. And as a result, the thing that I found the most interesting is 
letting go of that frustration and anger and trying to be less mad at the horse and trying to hold my myself more accountable meant that like when I was getting difficult horses I had an, a, a lot easier of a time calming down even like the most stressed horses because of that because I wasn't coming in being their adversary and fighting with them and it meant that they were more likely to feel calm and safe around me and actually do what I wanted them to do and then as a result both of us were happier and it was easier in training I was less frustrated I was getting less like physically like exerted because you're not frustrated like chasing after a horse and getting mad at them all the time and this isn't even about adopting like a completely positive reinforcement based program like a lot of people mistake what I say as being like oh like fuck you if you do negative reinforcement that's not what I'm saying it's how you go about using it because if you're using negative reinforcement where when the horse doesn't respond you're just like ah I'm mad at you now I'm just gonna keep getting louder because you aren't responding to this cue that I'm trying to train and like let's just get louder and scare you If you're just doing that where you escalate it to the point where it like becomes punishing, then like, yes, that's not good and not the best way to train. But if you use negative reinforcement in the sense where you're like, okay, like they're not responding. How can I show them the better way of doing this without continuing to escalate pressure to the point of like scaring them immensely and stressing them? That's really all it is. It's just learning how to soften your approach to be easier for the horse to understand and less scary for them and less punishing. And it's not about saying that like, oh, in order to be ethical, you have to be exactly like me or else. No, it's saying that like a lot of the stuff that we've normalized in the horse world is not okay and is not overly effective and causes a lot of the issues that we claim it solves. And if we want to address these problems, we have to look within ourselves and change. And it's not going to be an easy instantaneous change, which is also why like, I don't like the whole idea of like holding people so accountable that like, even like, like if 10 years down the road, someone is still on Mark's ass, ass about this video, even though he's shown actions that he has changed, then that's where it gets not fair because there's no incentive for people to change. If you're always holding them to the same degree as like the first time you met them or the bad experience you had for them like it wouldn't be fair for someone from my life when I showed Arabians to come up to me and be like oh well you used to show in a twisted wire snaffle and you used to hit your horse and you were way harsher and you used to ride him super behind the vertical and do roll curve and you used to do this so you're a bad person It wouldn't be helpful for someone to do that to me now because I've learned from what I did and I'm actively trying to better my horsemanship constantly as a result. So for someone to bring up stuff from my past and try to hold me accountable for it now would not make sense because my actions have changed. And I've really tried to self-reflect and be honest with myself, even when I lose patience. Because now when I lose patience in training, it's not going to look like what Mark Todd's does, where he's hitting the horse with the branch. When I lose patience in training and I'm frustrated with the horse, it probably looks like me literally just leaving the arena and being like, okay, like I need a break or like pausing and hacking the horse or thinking of a different way I can teach them the same thing. It, it It's about removing yourself from the situation if you can't handle yourself and conduct yourself properly. Or it's about trying to find a different way to show your horse how to do something in a way that's less stressful and is more constructive to their learning. And that's really it's all about it's not about being perfect. It's not about being mistake free. It's about actually caring enough to hold yourself accountable for your mistakes, to self reflect and to not be apathetic about the state of the horse world, because otherwise nothing will change. If we never advocate for the change we would like to see, there is no incentive for people to change. And The horse world is made up mostly of people who are not at the top of the sport. The Mark Todd's of the sport are like the 1%. We can hold them accountable as a community and we can demand for the type of horsemanship we would like to see because honestly, the horse world is reliant on all of these little people holding up the backbone of the sport. They're reliant on us, like our little yearly membership fees, even if we don't show just being subscribed to certain membership fees for whatever reason. They are what help them continue to do the stuff, the big stuff for the big wigs of the sport. We are the ones that are spending the most money at like the base levels of the sport, the foundation, not the upper level riders. So we can set the tone for what we'd like to see. And if we simply just stop accepting certain ways of doing things, it's going to make it less comfortable for the trainers that are anti-change to continue staying the same. And eventually they'll be forced to change or phase themselves out of the sport. And that's kind of what we need to do is like just set standards and set 
what your bare minimums are and stick to it. Like you don't need to be apathetic. And so many people have told me that there's no point in speaking out and that like I'm wasting my time and that this is the way it's always been and stuff. And it's like, speak for yourself, man. I've seen a lot of change happen. And I've even seen like people who have specifically come to me and disagreed with me and bullied me and like completely written off my expertise and me as a person come back to me later and say that they've learned something and they've started to try something I suggested that then worked for them. So to say that talking doesn't work is a bold faced lie. And it is also the language of the apathetic and the people who cannot self-reflect because they do not want to see change because they fear the change because they think they might be targeted by the change. So they tell you that talking doesn't matter, but it is a lie. So much societal change has been brought by people just having the desire to talk and advocate for it. Like so much outside of the horse world everywhere. So many things wouldn't have changed if people didn't advocate for them. So advocacy matters. And honestly, the way I see it is like, okay, let's say like me talking doesn't do anything. Cool. Whatever. Like at least I tried. You want to know what else won't do anything? Shutting the fuck up and not saying anything and ignoring the stuff that bothers me and never holding people accountable. Being apathetic and not saying anything definitely will not incite change. Not ever advocating for yourself won't bring change. Not ever holding yourself accountable won't bring change. So being apathetic does not bring change, and that's a definitive. If by chance me talking brings no change and is pointless, all I have done is wasted my own time doing something that I am passionate about and that I think is important. But if by chance I even change the mind of one person or even start them on a path where they start to consider even the slightest bit different things from what they used to, I have already incited change. And there's nothing to lose then, in my opinion. There's a lot more to lose by being apathetic because apathy harms horses. Apathy encourages the abuse of horses. It encourages the abuse of students. It makes people feel alone when they could be struggling with the same problems as you if you'd spoken out about them. And this isn't saying that everyone has to speak out about their problems, but apathy and hiding how you feel about things makes people feel alone in their views. And it also enables all of these upper level riders and trainers who go, oh, you can't talk. You've not competed at this level. You don't know what you're talking about. It enables them in doing so even more because the people who have misgivings about them are never hearing an alternative. And then they feel that they are just inexperienced and stupid and that they are thinking about things from a place of lacking experience rather than from a place of concern and being less indoctrinated into thinking certain normals are like certain things are normal. Um, And like, I like, I don't know the best way to word like the very degree of like how badly indoctrinated riders are because we are literally systematically trained to not care about certain levels of abuse from the very beginning. And you are taught by people intentionally omitting information or omitting it out of sheer ignorance. Like they'll be like, oh, use this harsh bit. It works better because your horse likes it. And then you're like, okay, cool. Like, wow, it's easier to ride my horse. He's less heavy in my hands. Neat. And then you take that and you're like, oh yeah, well, my trainer said this bit was fine. My horse likes it. He goes better in it. So that must mean he likes it. It's easier for me to ride and force him to do things. So that must mean he likes it. And then you take that with you for decades after, and it just becomes a belief. And it's the same thing with riders starting out hitting their horses. I highly doubt most children when they're first coming in to work with horses are compelled to hit them. I highly doubt it. I know I wasn't. It had to be trained into me where I would get publicly humiliated in lessons if I did not smack my horse with the crop or kick them when my trainer asked. So then it became where they're negatively reinforcing you to do something by humiliating you until you do it. And then when you do it, they leave you alone and they're like, yeah, good job. You did it. You make him go. Woo. You made the horse go. You showed him his boss. You're the best. And then you get like the only compliments that you get from your trainer for doing stuff like that makes you feel powerful, makes you feel appreciated. Your trainer has rewarded you for it after public publicly making you feel like shit for not doing the thing. And then over time, this constant conditioning starts to just make you do these things without even questioning or thinking about them. And I think that like for people who still agree with this and are like defending Mark, I think that they need to start being honest with how like that type of narrative in their head was actually created because it comes from being like specifically trained to respond that way yeah
Yeah, and on Twitter, there's a lot of people who, like, try to derail, like, non-equestrians being blown away by how bad our sport can be. And, like, it's, like, instead of trying to shame them into shutting up, why don't you make our sport actually something to be proud of and, like, promote education and, like, promote the good in the industry so that we don't have to be so fucking embarrassed or trying to cover up shit when stuff like this comes out. And... Yeah. Like, I would say a lot of non-horse people are actually more perceptive in terms of, like, recognizing stress in horses and recognizing cruel practices than a lot of horse people are because they've not been indoctrinated or trained to, like, ignore these things and not see these things. And, like, that's the other problem with all these trainers having no behavioral credentials because I would say one of the most key components to safety in riding and ethicality in riding is being able to read subtle stress signs in the horse accurately and being able to actually accurately read equine behavior. And unfortunately, a lot of trainers do not know how to read behavior properly themselves. And so they teach their students certain things that are not true that then teach their students to generalize stress behaviors as normal horse behaviors. And then their kids can't de-escalate situations before they become dangerous because they're learning to just generalize a chronically stressed horse as like a happy, normal one. And then when the horse does react, it's out of nowhere and the rider can be caught by surprise and thereby endangered because of that. And there's way too many behaviors that are normalized as like just regular horse behaviors. Like even the whole thing where people will be like, oh, like my sassy mare swishing her tail. And it's like literally a helicopter tail the entire fucking time you're riding them. And it's like, that is not normal. That's not normal. And even like the idea that like certain looks of stress in the eye are just normal for the horse. And it's like, if your horse truly looks that stressed every single day, There is something in their management and training that needs to be addressed desperately. And yeah, no, in in the video, it's definitely not just swishing the branch at the horse. You can hear it cutting through the air and hitting the horse in the video if you turn sound on. And yeah, so like we're taught to ignore signs of discomfort and stress in horses or label them as normal behaviors. And then it makes it impossible to actually accurately communicate with your horse because you're mislabeling so many different behaviors. Like the stressed face in a horse, like there's so many subtle signs of stress that are like there, there's some nuance to it. So you have to deal with it situationally. Like a horse swishing its tail more during fly season is not the same as a horse riding around with its helicopter tail, wringing its tail the whole time. Like certain behaviors can occur in the instance of having like a quieter, calm horse, as well as during cases of stress, which is why it's important that students learn how to actually properly read it. And yeah, so I would say that like, that's one of the huge like it that's one of the strengths a lot of these trainers have in terms of indoctrinating their students is improperly teaching them stress behaviors because even regular stall vices like cribbing and like weaving and stuff like that they're like unanimously called stress behaviors and stress vices because they're only seen in chronically stressed horses typically in a stabled environment but like at least in my experience growing up, like we saw a high instance of these behaviors and they were written off as just being quirky or the horse playing and having fun or just as something they did never to actually connect them to the true cause of why they were behaving a certain way. It was always just like, Oh, haha, like he's just dancing. And then it's like, okay, you're not learning that that's like a repetitive stress behavior that the horse is doing because they literally hate their fucking life and that they can't, like they never get to see the outside of a stall. And so it's important that we teach things correctly, even if it means like admitting like, hey, this horse that I have in training right now is stressed right now. It's like it's not a weakness to be aware that your horse is struggling with anxiety if you're actively working to address it. it it's a weakness to be so in, unable to self-reflect and address your own shortcomings in training or like why your horse is behaving a certain way that you rewrite why they're doing it and try to deny it. That is a weakness that shows some fragility. And, um, so like, I think it starts with just getting trainers to actually properly teach behavioral science to students, but also that needs to happen by ensuring that trainers that before they can practice professionally, that they're actually educated and have qualifications so that they're not misleading students by teaching them incorrect stuff.
And there's so much misinformation that is taught. It's absolutely absurd. Like it sucks because it's like, wow, I wasted so many years of my riding career paying people who were not qualified to be teaching me. And then like, then, then it's like all these wasted years, all this wasted time being taught utter bullshit that I could have in theory have spent under someone who knew what they were talking about. That would actually teach me the right way of doing things. And yeah, so it's, it's sad. Uh, to the person you just said, to what level have you trained a horse and in which discipline? Luckily, horse behavior doesn't differ by level or discipline, and no horse enjoys being fucking hit with a branch. So that's irrelevant. But if you want to look up my credentials, they are on my website. And luckily, they exceed the vast majority of professionals at any level because I actually have a relevant education. So I don't really care about what level I compete to. But if you want to fund my competition career, I'm perfectly happy to show and move up the levels at your expense doing so ethically but with that said I don't value a show record or the level at which someone competes like anyone can get to certain levels in horse riding and do so unethically and win so being there at that level doesn't mean fucking jack shit it means nothing if you can get there by abusing your horse and mistreating your horse and mislabeling stress behaviors and without any formal behavioral education I don't value that as a credential Because for me to get to where I have in the industry, I've had to self-reflect. I've had to grieve what I did to my horses in the past. I've had to completely undo untrue shit that I was taught by trainers that caused me to mistreat my horses and mismanage them. And I've had to do that all on my own and advocate for myself in my education and choose to seek it out out of sheer willpower and do so despite all of these upper level equestrians encouraging the exact opposite. It is a choice. It is a dedicated practice. And it's a choice that I made simply to better myself as an equestrian. And it's not something that gets me titles. It's not something that gets me a lot of attention. It's not something that garners as much respect as a show record so realistically there's not a whole lot of benefit in it if you want attention and all the bells and whistles and if you want to be like walking down the red carpet and respected as an upper level equestrian I don't get appreciated as much but I get appreciated more by the horses that I handle and I'm more ethical because of it so to answer your question feel free to look up my credentials they will outweigh the vast majority of upper level riders you'll find good luck finding an upper level rider competing at the top of the sport that has a IAABC behavior certification and an equine sciences certificate. Good luck finding someone who does. There's very few of them because they wouldn't be able to compete and ride how they do. Then with without have with, with having that education because it would cause them to reevaluate how they train. Um, The question is only what abuse is. To me, it is abuse to put children in this world. Well, um, we're not talking about personal opinions of abuse. We're talking about tangible, stressful types of training that incite fear and pain and undue stress in animals. And all of those things are quantifiable. So they're not an opinion. And I think most people would agree that hitting any animal with a fucking branch is abusive. So... um, With all due respect, we're not going to argue semantics. We're going to argue tangible facts. And the fact of the matter is it is frightening for a flight animal to be repeatedly struck with a branch. And the reason why we know this is because we have entire ethograms full of equine behavior and stressors and actual tested studies where they have measured blood cortisol levels and other markers of stress to quantify the level of stress that these animals feel when they do these certain behaviors. So it's not really. A matter of opinion. It's fact. And you can't deny the stress that an animal feels when they are being repeatedly struck with an object while being tried, like while someone's trying to usher them towards something that they are also afraid of. Like, think of your worst fear. And if you were like standing on the edge of a fucking cliffside and someone's just beating you with a bamboo switch, are you really going to tell me that you find that enjoyable? If the, if your alternative is to either continue being beaten or to leap to your death or to whatever fear inducing stimulus there is, that is abusive. There's no argument about it. Abuse is mistreating a creature for like, like out of, and it doesn't have to even be done maliciously you can abuse animals and people by accident there's a there's numerous instances of it 
what led you to want to go to school to learn animal behavior um getting milo was like kind of the the like the catalyst for that um so oh my god okay i'm gonna get into that in a second but this i'm gonna mute you in a second i'll answer this one last question because it's this is a very common sense so what about putting a horse into a pasture with an electric fence okay the electric fence does not move. The electric fence stays in one spot. If the horse touches it, it shocks them. If they are not touching it, they're not being shocked. So not only is the electric fence constantly the same response, it is just a barrier. The horse is not being trapped or chased into it, like what Mark Todd was doing with the whip. And it's an immediate, the same response every single time. Whereas with a person holding a branch, the, the, the timing is always different. It's not only a barrier method where it's like, oh, if you touch this one thing that you can willingly touch and move away from at will, therefore you have control over the environment. Not the same. If you are literally winding your horse up in electric tape and shocking the shit out of them, that is abusive. But no, using a barrier method to keep horses in a safe enclosure and off of roads that they have full control over is not the same as repeatedly striking an animal and you fucking know it. I know you are not that dense and ignorant. You are just trying to pick apart little tiny things to try to deflect from the point. It is very clear they are not even the same thing at all. An electric fence is something the horse learns through classical conditioning. If you don't know what classical conditioning is, it is conditioning that occurs of the animal's own accord naturally. It's not operant conditioning. A human is not involved at all. The horse learns the consequences of the fence naturally through learning that it shocks them only when they touch them, which means they're not as likely to be fearful of it to the same degree because the fence is not moving and chasing them. If you decided to move and chase them with a fence, yes, they would be way more afraid of it. But they learn like, hey, this is the barrier. If I stay over here, I am safe. That level of autonomy and control over the environment is what reduces the fear of it. Okay, so what what um, led you to want to go to school to learn animal behavior? Getting Milo is kind of what started that because it became very abundantly clear to me that you cannot like that, that the methodologies I was using were not going to work on him. When I tried to use like pressure and release based tactics, even for something just like trailer loading, he would rear up. He'd like literally refuse to go in impossible to get him in was not working, made him more dangerous. He would round on me. He would be aggressive. And it was just very clear that there was a lot of holes in this practice of training that would not work for this horse. So I started to explore more science-based training and wanting to learn about horses from a scientific perspective because I also wanted to consider going into horse training. And I figured that it made more sense to start off with these classes rather than going into university. So what I did was like start off with, I think I started off with equine exercise physiology as my first one um, for training perspective for like producing sport horses. And then I went into like equine behavior and all that stuff. And I started learning and picking away at like behavioral science and learning about operant conditioning, how horses learn about different types of reinforcers, like the difference between negative reinforcement and positive reinforcement in terms of how it is like experienced by the horse. And then I started experimenting with those different types of training methods with Milo and seeing them work. And then the more I learned, the more I adapted my method because I was studying like equitation science as well. And equitation science uses negative reinforcement, but it's non-escalating reinforcement. So it was different from what I'd been taught because I'd essentially been taught just to get louder and louder and louder until you get a response. And then I quickly learned like how much more effective these lighter methods were and the more I used them the more abundantly clear that came to me and I would gradually like kind of adapt my method as I went regarding that like it was it's not something that you can really change instantaneously but like it was a necessary change because I literally wouldn't have been able to successfully train Milo to do anything if I continued to try to use the really punishing forceful methods that I'd been taught because they did not work on him and he literally would have killed me like he's the type of horse that if you try to like make him do something he will like turn on you and be like fuck you and he'll fight you and like now that he knows me so well that's not always the case, but if I really, if I tried to lay into him in the way that a lot of trainers still do, especially if I was someone he did not know, he would like round on you and he would win that fight. Like I can't imagine watching someone try to like show him who's boss because he would show you who's boss. And 
when you have a horse like that, like you can't make them do anything. And it then, then you have to learn how to actually motivate them to do it in a way that isn't going to cause them to be dangerous. And that was a huge eye opener for me because I'd always had horses who you could push around to a certain degree and who were easier to get motivated by using forceful tactics. So when I had him, it was like, holy shit, this horse is giving me a run for my money. And if I don't learn a new way to do things, we're both going to get injured, but especially me. And yeah, like that was kind of the big thing for me was getting him because he was just so different from anything I'd ever had. And yeah, like he, he, he's very special to me because of that. Like, I'm thankful that I had him and I, I have him and I'm thankful that I got him when I did. Um, even though I still made mistakes in his training that I regret and I would do stuff differently now, obviously, cause I've had like, I've owned him for like eight years now. So I've had eight years of learning to do things. So if I could go back eight years ago, obviously I would do things differently than I did from the start. Cause I've learned that much more. And they're like, if you can't say that, then it's, you've probably not like adapted your method that much, like for anyone. Um, and yeah, so it was him that kind of started all of that. And I'm really thankful for him because I'm also thankful that I got him. Cause I don't know that a lot of people would have been as patient with him as I have. Like, obviously there's some really patient people who would have been more patient than I was in the beginning. But the odds of him getting one of the types of people who wouldn't have been patient and who would have only seen like the potential in him and wanted to exploit that to his own detriment. I'm glad that he came to me instead because he could have been a horse that could have landed in a lot of bad situations. And um, yeah, and he's also taught me a lot. So, yeah. But um, and I think that horses that are like that teach people I think horses that are like that teach people the most because like it teaches you to like, I don't know, like a method is not not that effective if it has a very high chance of fallout and doesn't work on like all types of species. Um, and positive reinforcement does work on all types of species and it has the lowest risk of behavioral fallout in terms of like reinforcers because like aversives cause more stress and the more stressed a horse is, the higher risk you have with behavioral fallout. So we could all benefit from just softening our methods and kind of learning how to adopt more rewards-based tactics. Cause honestly, the amount of like motivation that you can get from actually making an animal want to do something for a reward versus like getting them to do it to escape an aversive is like entirely different. So I think that that's the other thing is that there's a completely untapped side of horse training or largely untapped side of horse training that if we start to adopt more re rewards based methods if we have this many horses who will work as hard as they will for us using force based tactics that are highly punishing in some cases imagine how much more they would do if they were intrinsically motivated to do it for a reward and i think that's pretty amazing like we could completely remodel how we view the horse world and how horses perform for us if we just kind of alter how we view the training of them cuz like until recently a lot of horse training is just about making horses do things cuz they've been work animals in the past and they're viewed as livestock but now that we're using them for pleasure and sport we should start treating them like sporting athletes in the same way as what you see with like dogs like you'd be hard pressed to see a whole lot of like people training their dogs for agility and dog sports without using any type of rewards based methods and dogs that like rewards are just highly motivating because the animal actually wants to seek it so if you can teach them to want to seek a behavior for the reward that follows it it's very very motivating and you're more likely to get a good response from the animal so yeah, it's just some food for thought. And I think everyone has the capacity to change. And honestly, like it would be really cool to see Mark Todd start to adopt some softer methods to teach horses how to get over their fear of water and stuff. And honestly, I think he'd see an awful lot more success with it. So here's to hoping he changes. And here's your reminder that like you don't have to like condone his behavior in that video like the, the options aren't just cancel Mark Todd or defend his behavior in the video. You can cancel him for his behavior in the video and say like, I want to see change from him and I don't trust him anymore and move on like that. But we don't need to defend his behavior in the video. Like if you're going to share, I support Mark Todd, make sure you damn well follow it up with, but I don't support beating a horse to the branch. And yeah, 
anyways, I'm going to roll out because I got to go. That's kind of my view on Mark Todd and what he did. And I truly hope that he's learned from this and that he's going to adopt different methods because he will see more success in causing behavioral change in horses anyways, if he just gets some kinder, softer methods. And yeah, so it, it all starts with just caring enough to self-reflect and like wanting to change. Cause honestly, like you have to be so up your own ass to like, just be like, Oh yeah. Like there's no better way to do things than what I'm doing right now. I could not possibly be better because like chances are you could be, we could all improve. We're all learning. Like it's okay to not know everything. It's okay to learn more and to be constantly studying and learning as a rider. It's fine. It's not a weakness. In fact, it's a strength. Like I don't trust trainers who are like, I don't need a trainer I don't need to learn anything I know everything and it's like okay that 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 is saying something but it's not saying what you think it is um it, for resources if you want to start looking into like science-based training and animal behavior I have a ton of resources on my resource page for like studies and like different types of like podcasts and whatnot to go to so if you go down to the like description of this live and click on like my website page and go to the resources page. I have like a book section. I have training equipment session and I have resources for like different studies and how to find credible sources and like courses if anyone's interested in taking them and all sorts of that stuff all on my resources page. So I'd recommend heading there because it will link you to a lot of different places that you can go and start looking. And then from there, you can acquire a lot more resources and whatnot. So yeah, like I, it all starts with just like the curiosity and like wanting to learn more and change. And I think that all horse people should have a little bit of that because a lot of us have been taught incorrect information from the very beginning of our riding career. And the only way you can unlearn that is with some curiosity and wanting to learn how to do things a different way. So anyways, thank you all for listening. And yeah, if you share the, I support Mark Todd thing, make sure you follow it up with like, I don't support what he did in the video, okay? But I support the fact that he might be able to change and become a nicer person. Otherwise, it's just like, I support hitting horses with branches and that's how everyone else is going to see it. So let's not do that because like you can, you don't have to completely hate someone to not like their behavior in a certain instance. And his behavior in that video wasn't acceptable, especially because it's really clear that the rider that was on the horse that he did it to was not okay or comfortable with what happened. And bottom line even if we're going to go at it just from like the rider perspective they paid to be in that clinic and he needs to respect the riders that he's teaching more and not put them in such an uncomfortable situation and yeah so here's to hoping we get more trainers that'll accurately bring riders up from a young age because I can only imagine how much further ahead I would have been now if I had learned things the right way from the beginning and it's really sad to have to grieve all of those wasted years but it's a necessary part of personal growth and starting to adopt better methods. So anyways, thank you everyone for listening and I hope you all have an amazing day. If you want to check out my merch, this is from my merch store down at the link down below in the description. My bridles are also on pre-order right now if anyone's interested in those and we've released some springtime pads if anyone's interested. And like I said, resources page on my main website page if people want to look at studies and read more and kind of learn places that you can look to learn more information. And I also have a Patreon channel that you can subscribe to for as little as a dollar a month. And I post behind the scenes stuff there for like my product development and also training videos. If anyone's interested, that's also linked down below. If anyone is interested, thank you again for watching. And remember, you don't have to support a trainer's actions in every instance to value some of what they teach. So let's remember, we don't have to defend Mark Todd. We can hold people accountable without completely writing them off as a person. So accountability is good. Accountability brings change. Let's not be apathetic.